All right. Welcome, everyone. It's good to see you all this evening. Um, really excited to continue doing this. Um, just in case a couple of you that weren't here last week, <coughs> Q&A, things are here. We'll break after the presentation. And if you want to do a Q&A or stick around for that, you can, you can uh, submit questions that way, hang out. And if there are no questions, we'll still come back together briefly. We might pray together or, or something like that. Um, so we'll do that. The point of that is to give everyone a clean break. So if you need to go, like because it's your bedtime or you've got kids or whatever, you can go and not be kind of an awkward moment or anything. And then, uh, like I said, you can submit your questions at that time. Are the uh, Q&As on the videos as well? No. Okay. No. Um, all right. Um, let's pray. Oh, Lord, thank you so much for the chance to gather here again on this Wednesday. Lord, I ask that our time would be honoring to you, that it would be equipping for us. I ask that we would not forget that one of the reasons that we come together on Sunday and now Wednesday is to grow closer to each other. We recognize that we need not just to learn, not just to be equipped, not just to have some of our questions answered, not just to get to know you better, but to grow closer to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so Father, I ask that tonight would facilitate that, even if our interactions are not long, that something about striving together, coming alongside of each other to challenge and encourage each other and just remind each other we're running the same race, brother. Mm -hmm. And I ask that you would use tonight uh, to encourage us towards that for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I suppose tonight might be a little bit heavier of a topic. So maybe I thought I'd start off with a, an inspirational story, right? <laughs> Be nice if we could have at least a moment of that, right, before we get into the darkness of it all. I'm not really good at that, I don't know. Um, so I'm just going to have to share someone else's inspiring story. Okay? Um, I'm, I'm going to have to tap into my nerdiness again and go straight to the Lord of the Rings again. Uh, um, in the movie version of The Two Towers, there's the scene where these two characters are talking, and they're uh, they're sort of like your archetypical philosopher king. You've got Aragorn and Gandalf. And they're both old, they're both very wise, and they're both very powerful. And if you know the story, you know there's this fellowship of nine who have this li literal uh, world-saving task. And they all have a different role to play in this task, and they've been split up now to do various different things. And Aragorn and Gandalf are together at this time, and they get a brief moment to sort of reflect on how things are going and their, their thoughts go to other members of their party who are not with them, that they have no way of knowing how things are going and uh, are in contact with them. And, and they really know that even if they are successful in their part, if Frodo isn't successful in his part in taking the ring of power to Mount Doom and destroying it, that no success of theirs will save the world, will be all for naught. And they're understandably a bit concerned about how Frodo might be doing. And so Aragorn says something along the lines of, of, of this concern. And he's, you know, again, remember, he's old, he's powerful, he's wise. And the equally, if not older, wiser and more powerful Gandalf comforts Aragorn with a response. He just simply says to him, what does your heart do? And then Aragorn doesn't really say anything in response. He just looks back at him. Something about what Gandalf has said has had an impact on him. He's encouraged as if he somehow knows, yeah, everything is going to be all right. And Gandalf looks back lovingly at him. And they just both have this silent moment of everything's going to be okay. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Are you inspired? 
you've looked deep inside the well of your heart, and now you know that everyone's going to be okay and the world will be saved. Uh, well, what I want to do here right now is welcome you to Rome. Okay, I'd like to welcome you to... Did you know you were in Rome? Did you know that? All right. Well, let me describe Rome to you. And you'll, if you didn't know, I think you'll be pretty convinced this is where we are. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity that their bodies might be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Welcome to Rome. I thought I might start tonight off by sharing a couple of anecdotes of modern day Rome. And it would go something like this. I'd share two or three, and then I would say something like, and I could go on and on. And you would all acknowledge your head, and then we would move on. I decided I'm not going to be that merciful. I'm going to go on and on and on here for a few minutes. Okay? I want to drag you into the journey I've been on for getting ready for tonight. Even just the journey of trying to decide what to call tonight's talk. At one point I thought, you know, if I just could lift like a, a really catchy slogan or a phrase from our culture, that'd be the hip thing to do, you know, that would sort of summarize the topic in, in one little thing. I thought of a lot that could possibly work. You know, one is innocuous enough, we say it, you know, you do you, right? That's really common, you know? It's a sort of libertarian ideal of just, hey man, just you're new, you're one thing, I'm different, and that's beautiful, and it sort of is. You do you. That's cool, man. I thought, uh, you know, this one's my favorite. A few of you aren't regulars here, so you may not know this about me. And, and those of you who are do know that I like to harp on Disney a lot. But maybe you've wondered why. Well, tonight I think I'll put that to rest. We could just tap into the universal message that Disney's been trying to sell us for many decades. Believe in yourself. Follow your heart. All right. Or one of my favorites, live your truth or speak your truth, as if that's a thing for you and not for me, or apparently I have a different tr truth, however that works. Or to tap into my geek again, I could go back to 1980, Empire Strikes Back, a certain point of view. You remember this scene where, where Ben Kenobi has to explain to Luke Skywalker why he lied to him. Of course, we know that the real reason he did that is because George <coughs> Lucas changed his mind and he had to fill the gap. But on this one, I'll share the story briefly. 30 plus years ago, we were living in Linden, so it had to be 30 plus, you know, about 30 years ago. I was watching a TV show, Boy Meets World, and I don't remember actually watching that show, except for this one time, so I think this might have been the only episode I ever watched. We had two TVs in the house, and I was watching it in one room, and my dad might have known it, or he must have known that I was watching it, because he was watching it in another room. 
And, and I don't remember the line, but it was, you know how all the sitcoms back then had to have like a moral, they had to tie it all up with like a cute little moral at the end of the day. I don't remember exactly how it went, but the, 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 the teacher, the wise sage, the one who's supposed to be the, the moral authority of the show, basically teaches the young child a, a version of Obi-Wan Kenobi's, you know, a certain point of view sort of mentality, right? And that was the, the moral feel good of, of the show. Now, I've heard it said that in every worship pastor or Christian, you know, there's a frustrated preacher, right? And in every good preacher, there's a frustrated worship leader, right? So I guess I'm just frustrated, frustrated. <laughs> My dad might not be a pastor, right? But he is the son of one. And I can definitely tell he's a frustrated preacher. <laughs> he walks into the room where I'm watching the show. He turns the TV off. That's a lie from the pit of hell, he says to me. He could preach, right? Yeah. You remember that? Sure. <laughs> 30 years later, it left an impression on me. Right? What came, that kind of discernment came in really handy for me in just a year or two. Thanks, Dad. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. When there was a really popular song on the radio, huge song. And to be honest, I listened to it a few times today just to get reacquainted with it. A beautiful song. Powerfully sung by an, an exceptionally talented musician. Sung with the, the lyrical and musicality of a, of a mother trying to comfort her child, but also the inspiration tone of like a coach saying, you can do this, right? Mariah Carey, hero. You remember these words? There's a hero if you look inside your heart. You don't have to be afraid of what you are. There's an answer if you reach into your soul and the sorrow that you know will melt away. It's a long road when you face the world alone. No one reaches out a hand for you to hold. You can find love if you search within yourself and the emptiness you felt will disappear. And then a hero comes along with a strength to carry on and you cast your fears aside and you know you can survive. So when you feel like hope is gone, look inside you and be strong and you'll finally see the truth that a hero lies in you. And in my 13 year old mind, you know what I said? That's a lie from the pit of hell. <laughs> Cause daddy knew what he was saying, talking about. <laughs> From their generation, you know, I love this one. You know, um, Frank Sinatra's My Way, of course. For what is a man? What has he got? If not himself, then he has not. To say the things he truly feels and not the words of one who kneels. The record shows I took the blows and did it my way. Let's come back into the 21st century. I could read you the whole lyric, but just the chorus will suffice, I think. I'm beautiful in my way because God makes no mistakes. I'm on the right track, baby. I was born this way. My favorite poem, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment in the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Let's, let's keep going. <laughs> I thought maybe I could just rehearse for you a history of certain legal decisions and developments that we've encountered over the last few years related to this topic. I would maybe start back in 1996, the good old days, when the conservative president, Bill Clinton, signed the Defense of Marriage Act into law, which enshrined as definitional that marriage is between one man and one woman. The good old days, back when conservatives were in the White House. It's, <laughs> wow. We could go to 2013, United States versus Windsor, a 5-4 decision, which essentially then overturned Doma. Not completely, but it took all of its power away. And an important comment in the opinion was that the other four, so the four who didn't vote in favor of overturning it, we're committing constitutional animus. That's code for what uh, Carl Truman calls irrational bigotry. So five, 
have the gall to call the other four irrational bigots. And every Christian for 2,000 years an irrational bigot. Every Jew for 4,000 years an irrational bigot. Every Hindu, every Muslim, every, they're just irrational bigots. And that would, of course, pave the way for the big decision in 2015, Obergefell, which officially legalized same-sex marriage. More important than the decision was the rationale. Why? Well, it essentially came down to autonomy. People have a right to choose whom they marry. Love is love, baby. That outcome should not have been a surprise. It was shocking, but it should not have been a surprise if we were paying attention. Because you could go as far back as this one in 1992. I just recently learned about this one. Planned Parenthood had sued the governor of Pennsylvania for signing into state law policies that would have restricted abortion. Unsurprisingly, Planned Parenthood won. But the shocking thing about this is Justice Anthony Kennedy's opinion had the gall to write this. He actually tried an attempt of defining what a human being is. In 1992, this is what he wrote. At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. That was in 1992. Why were we shocked when Obergefell happened in 2015? 2020? A Supreme Court ruling allowed Title VII to apply to trans individuals. Title VII was part of the civil rights package law that was feminist in nature. It was about protecting women's rights in employment, saying you couldn't disclose. This was supposed to be one of our great societal victories, and I want to say, where are all the feminists now? 2021, within hours of his inauguration, hours of his inauguration, President Biden signed an executive order called Preventing and Combating Discrimination on the Basis of Gender Identity or Sexual Orientation, which required public schools to open their bathrooms. The reversal of Title IX, women's sports, are now open to biological men. I'm going to keep going. I thought maybe, you know, there's not a lot of books. Check this out. I've been doing a lot of reading lately. <laughs> I love it. And I thought, maybe I'll just use one of these book titles as, as my title. Here's a good one. <coughs> when Harry Became Sally. <laughs> right? You know the movie, right? When Harry Met Sally. So the big question in that movie was, can, can men and women be friends? The question of our day is, can a man be a woman? This is, uh, if I were you, if I were in medicine, if I were in law, if I were in education, I'd read this book. I'd study it. I'd maybe even memorize portions of it. That, but that could be a pretty good one, right? And then there's this one. It's called, it's called Them Before Us. Them Before Us. You know who's, who's often and almost always overlooked in all these discussions? The kids. We've made marriage about adult desire. We've made abortion about adult desire. We've made any, any number of, of various practices with ch children about what men and women want and not about what the kids have rights to. Kids have a right to a mom, a right to a dad, and to a right to some measure of stability. Who's, who's fighting for justice for them? That could have been our whole message tonight. I'd recommend that to everyone in the church. It's wonderful. It's a great combination of facts and stories for those of you who... Um, appreciate that balance. There's another book. I, I didn't read it, but I listened to the author and a few of her long-form interviews, Irreversible Damage. Have any of you heard of this book by Abigail, Abigail Schreier? Really interesting because she, she's not a Christian. She's not conservative. Best I can tell, she's pro-gay marriage. But when it comes to the trans issue, sanity appeared. And just being a decent journalist, she realized something. These kids are being damaged for money. No, ultimately, I landed on this one, Strange New World. Uh, this is a book by Carl Truman. Again, I highly recommend it. This is a short version of his longer book. And it's uh, set up in a way that it's 
nine chapters. It's got discussion questions. You might want to, life group leaders, might be a good one. And that's the title of tonight's talk, Strange New World. It is a strange one, isn't it? We live in the world where locker rooms, bathrooms, the sign on it, they mean nothing. We live in the world where Leah Thomas dominates the women's swimming records, right? And then goes into the same locker with them and exposes them to his anatomy. Um, check this one out. Men are now going to women's prisons because they identify as women. So this, this amazing thing to have, we live in unprecedented times. Women are getting pregnant by women. <laughs> yeah, strange, strange new world. Um, here's, a, here's a really tough question. It's been stumping philosophers forever. What is? Well, Katanji Brown Jackson couldn't answer it because she's not a biologist. Apparently, you have to be one of those to answer that question. Yeah, strange new world, indeed. I want to sh share a story about one other book, and more importantly, its author. An up-and-coming mommy blogger, as they say, by the name of Glennon Doyle. Talented writer. Talented, talented writer. She wrote in such a way that a lot of people were inspired by her writing. People were encouraged, empowered. In 2016, she had a pretty popular book out at the time, and she became famous when she left her husband for a woman by the name of Amy Wambach, the famous female soccer player. You may remember that story. Four years later, 2020 arrived, and we think that 2020 started with COVID, but I don't know if you remember this, but before COVID, we were already talking about how bad a year it was. Going into COVID, going into the, the summer stuff and the murder of George Floyd, all those things that captured our attention that year, Right before that all happened, the number one book across all, all, everything was a book by the name of Untamed by the same author, Glennon Doyle, where she wrote about her story, about how she left her husband and all that. In that book, she characterized herself as a caged cheetah. She had a wild nature and she had been forced by her owners, by her masters in a way, to be someone, something that she was not meant to be. And it is a story of her look inside herself to figure out her true wild nature and to set the cheetah free. And doing so, as she was taught, she would turn to the scriptures. She would go to the story where it all began and where she would find the story of Adam and Eve. You know the story. We tell the story about how Adam and Eve sinned against God and brought sin into the world. She had a different take. She said, maybe Eve is our model. Ladies, own your wanting. Eat the apple. Literally the oldest lie in the book. <laughs> And I've read part of her book. I didn't buy it. Jill knew I needed it. She went and got it from the library for me so I didn't have to support it. <laughs> she's, she's an exceptionally gifted writer. I, I, it's just true. In stunningly beautiful rhetoric, she's able to say, be like Eve. How she pulled that off is amazing. But you know what? Our enemy is pretty talented. She would then turn to Psalm 46. You know this one. Be still and know that I am God. Of course, she didn't quote the I am God part. She just said, be still and know. This became a model for her, for her new religion. She would spend time every single day and she would look inside of herself and she would discover the knowing with a capital K. That was her God. I'm going to save the rest of the story for the end. But I think she's a pretty good example of this new religion of the self. 
And I think it's going to go a long way to helping us understand our strange new world. One reason that this matters. It's possible that some of you go, identity, that sounds very existential and philosophical. And this matters so much, and I, and I hope you're already convinced of that. But the issue of identity is related to human nature. What is a human being? What's wrong with a human being? What does a human being need? Biblically, we would talk about how he's created in the image of God. We looked at that last week. In a few weeks, we'll look at the fall, and we'll look at how that answers the question of identity. And hopefully, remember that there's hope for us in the future. There's redemption. But even, even in, in politics, and in our modern discourse, I don't know if you realize this, because, you know, we, whatever it is, that, whatever ways we go about in consuming our news, sometimes this is more caught than taught, and, and sometimes you don't realize it, but this has really been at the center of our political discourse for many, many years, the question of identity. And some of the most important thinkers have articulated this. Some of you heard of Thomas Sowell. He explained one of the reasons that we have such differences in, in political and such division is because we have two fundamentally different understandings of human nature. He called it the unconstrained vision and the constrained vision. It doesn't matter for now, but this it's this or that. Uh, a, a political philosopher on the other side of the aisle by the name of Michael Sandel said it comes down to human nature the, uh, and the view of the self, the encumbered self or the unencumbered self. The people who have really thought about this have realized this really has been at the heart of our political discourse for a long time. And the question of personal identity helps us understand our relationship to the broader culture. Think about it. What is my relationship to the culture? Does the culture help me form my identity? Does it inform me of certain aspects of my identity? And so does it then serve me? Or... Am I the only one who really knows my identity? Is it my job to make sure I express that? And now it's the culture's job to validate that. You know, there are certain aspects of my identity that I didn't get to choose. Like, my parents chose my name. The doctor said it's a boy. The state issued my birth certificate. But maybe the doctor assigned it wrong. And how did my parents know my name? They just looked at me and they knew my name? I mean, how? <laughs> what were you thinking? <laughs> how did you know that I was a Dan and not an Oha Libama? <laughs> and every time I read through the Bible, I see all these names and it just resonates with me deeply. <laughs> like maybe I was made for that name. That I'm missing something. What, wouldn't it have been cool if you could have called me Oha Libama? And then for that's long. Yeah. So for short, you could just Oh Holy. <laughs> <laughs> for I was being bad, Oh Hole. <laughs> right? Well, how did we get here? How did we get here? I'll, I'll turn your attention to this. I had to write a small. Um, so I'll read it as we go. That's all I'm going to show you. I could, I could overwhelm you tonight with names and dates and that kind of thing. Got three ideas there in the middle and a thought bubble, a cloud, and then four thinkers who have contributed to the development of that thought bubble. I'm teaching this to you not as a matter of, oh, that's interesting, but I really believe this will help you understand the culture in which we live now. We want to understand how we got here. And this is a tool to help us do that. So... In the, in the thought bubble, and there in the middle, there are th there's three ideas that I want to go over with. You, the, the one at the top that you see there, if you can't, it says expressive individualism. Expressive individualism. Expressive individualism is essentially a mechanism to grant authority to one's inner feelings. Right? It is, my anatomy might say one thing, but I feel something else on the inside, and my feelings trump biology. Right? That's called expressive individualism, the granting of authority to inner feelings. Related to this is the concept of authenticity. We love that word in the 21st century. We talk about being our authentic self. Authentic authenticity is achieved when my outward expression is a reflection of my inward feelings. That's expressive 
individualism. Right? The second idea there is the sexual revolution, which is not so much an idea as uh, a moment in history. And, and the main point that I want to draw from this about how we think about it is we, we tend to think of this in history as this moment where there was this great liberation and an expansion of what was considered acceptable in terms of our sexual ethics. But it was far more than that. What we need to understand is it was not just an expansion. It was a politicized repudiation of the morals that had constrained humanity up to that point. And then third, the social imaginary. The social imaginary. This is basically... A common understanding of how we intuit the world. It's not necessarily the stuff we picked up in school. It's not necessarily the stuff that we can articulate in, in certain propositions. I don't know how many people actually go through life and examine their own worldview and can point it out plot by plot. Most people don't do that. So when I talk about it, it's basically the value system and the worldview that we more or less absorb and share in common. It, it rubs off on us and we catch it more than it's explicitly taught. So give me some examples of how things in our culture have contributed to the social imaginary, things like pornography. Right? Por pornography has made something that was once hard dangerously easy. When we think about the pornography of my youth, it was still fairly hard to get and you had to be exposed to some kind of shame to go get it by buying to a store, buying a magazine or whatever. And nowadays it's not, it's not a purchase away, it's a click away. Right? It's easy, shameless, and, and you can do it in private. No one has to know what you're doing. No fault divorce. President Reagan's responsible for this at that level, and he actually lamented. He says it was probably his worst political blunder of his career for allowing this to happen. No, for, no fault divorce allows couples to divorce because basically they've fallen out of love. Of love. So now, love, marriage, I should say, has been sentimentalized. Marriage is the relationship by which two people who love each other want to celebrate that. Right? That's what marriage has become in the age of no-fault divorce. You know, the feminism mantra about having control over their bodies, right? that's something we've all absorbed. Uh, of course, that completely overlooks the reality that abortion has nothing to do with women's bodies and everything to do with the bodies of the human beings inside their bodies, right? But the narrative is very much part of what we've been taken captive by. It's part of the social imaginary. Or think about the impact of the pill, right? It's certainly part of a narrative where it can be seen as a positive. Family planning can, can be a good thing and, and women can work and, and, and all that stuff. But there's no question that it also paved the way for sex as recreation. Because now, if a man and a woman who love each other, or don't, want the pleasure of it, and they want to be able to engage in the act without any risk of having to make a commitment, that's now on the table. So, so these kinds of things have contributed to a, a different kind of culture, where sex is, can be about pleasure and not commitment, Marriage can be about love and not commitment. All these things get co-opted by this. And again, that's, that wasn't necessarily taught to you, but it's very much caught in the culture. So let's use this tool, all right? Expressive individualism, the sexual revolution, and the social imaginary. Let, let me show you how understanding these things is going to help us answer a, a very basic question, all right? There's this idea in our culture that of a woman that is trapped in a man's body. And the question that I'm asking is, how did that become normal and accepted? Of course, I remember, as I'm sure many of you do, that, I don't know, 15 or so years ago, this is like a big deal when Oprah had someone on her show who was trans. It was like, whoa. Maybe you remember um, Sonny Bono, or uh, uh, Chastity Bono. I don't know that's what, you know, that, that was a big cultural moment for us, right? And then, of course, Chastity ends up on TV, on the Dancing with Star show or whatever, becomes this big cultural moment, you know. How did that happen? How did this become normal? Well, we're going to see how these four fingers have made it normal for us to think of that. So the first one is Rousseau. 
Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Two basic ideas. Now, you won't know all these names. I guarantee you, you're going to recognize their philosophies, okay? Two basic ideas. I bet you've heard this quote. Man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains. You heard that one? Probably on like a fortune cookie or something. <laughs> Man is born free, but everywhere he is in change. Meaning human beings in their natural state are in their freest state. And society wants to suppress that. So, so the individual is free and society suppresses that. You see? Man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains. So in this view, in order to be true and authentic, you have to look inside and not let society corrupt the inner self. It's from Rousseau that we get the idea of the noble savage. You ever heard of that? The noble savage was the ideal human in Rousseau's philosophy. This is someone who was uncorrupted by society, who lived in harmony with nature, and he answered to no one but himself. And if you know anything about Rousseau, he's a disgusting human being. And he really was. And it's not really politically correct to talk about people like that, but it's just true. This is the philosophy which allowed him to live that way and to feel that he was living nobly, is what this ends up being. You know, I want to live this way, and I'm going to figure out how to sound smart doing it. Man is born free, but everywhere he is in change. Oh, that's deep. No, it's corrupt. How does this relate to the modern day? Well, I can think of a couple examples of the way this kind of thinking ha has influenced us in our own culture, our um, social imaginary. I, I mentioned this in a few sermons ago. You know, it's funny to me how words all of a sudden become really popular. And I mentioned one in particular, gaslighting. That word has been a part of the English language for a long time. But have you noticed how everyone's talking about it now? Why? Now, see, I'm just totally cynical. When I pick up on things in that, like that, I go, what, what's going on here? All right? On some level, just in case, I guess, gaslighting is a particular kind of lying where you cause someone who might be right about something to doubt their own uh, understanding of something. Like a, a, a trivial example might be, is it, is it cold or is it me in here? And if it's actually cold, but I say, it's just you, that's gaslighting, right? So that's a trivial example, but, you know, this is a real thing, for sure. Gaslighting really does happen. I mean, the government gaslights us, right? Put this in your body. And, and trust me, there's no reason that you should not trust Moderna and Pfizer. They have a great track record. If they say it, you're good. I mean, that's a problem. But, but, here's the other, but here's the other thing that I think is actually the real problem. is that the term gaslighting has become a way of denying what is true. For instance, if I say something like, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, and you say, no, you're not, all I have to say is, you're gaslighting me. It's an excuse it's a way to turn down truth by saying, I know what I feel, and I'm going to live my truth. You can't tell me otherwise. Right? So gaslighting has serviced this idea of expressive individualism. Right? You don't get to call me out. Right? I know you don't. Or even the, uh, the modern idea of, you know, we're enamored with this now in our politicians. We just love politicians who, quote, tell it like it is. But really what that means is we love politicians who are rude and brash. Apparently this has become a quality that is endearing to us. Well, that's because of Rousseau. The, the idea of the noble savage, the ideal man is the man who's in touch with his inner self, who's in touch with nature, and he will not be bound by society. Whatever you think doesn't matter. Right, well, that's firmly anchored in Rousseau. So you might have not have known his name, but that's how we got here. All right, so the next thinker is Marx. We're going to actually look more in depth at his ideas next week. But I do want to, I want to set this in motion very briefly here 
This is really important. Um, Marx is probably one of the most important philosophers for us to be thinking about in 2023, which is why we're going to spend more time on this next week. It's absolutely shocking to me how much the church has allowed Marxism into the church because Marxism is far more than an economic philosophy. That is, that is the lie that must be dealt with. Marxism is a fundamentally opposed to God worldview, point by point by point. Right? Every worldview has about four basic components. It has a narrative, a creation, a fall, redemption, and consummation. All right? If you apply that same structure to the Marxist religion, and it is a religion, it is a comprehensive worldview, an answer to the question, what is Marxism's counterpart to creation? What's the origin of everything? It would boil down to this, self-creating, self-generating matter. Right? Because Marxism is fundamentally materialist. There's no God. All there is is stuff. So at the beginning, that's what we have. We have stuff. We have self-creating, self-generating matter. And then the question for, for fall, what, what's, where does suffering and pain come from? Marxism would answer by that question by saying, well, it's the rise of private property. Or the inequitable distribution of the stuff. All right? That's Marxism. Creation is stuff exists. The fall is when it's inequitably distributed. So what's redemption? You notice how this in this verge in this philosophy, sin does not mean there's one person in charge, which means we're not going to talk about an individual getting redeemed. We're not going to talk about forgiveness. We're not going to talk about sins being paid for. You know what we're going to do? We're just going to transfer the property back. That's the solution. So, so how does Marxism propose to set the world right again? Revolution. Overthrow the oppressors. Recreate the original paradise of primitive communism. Right? Th that's Marxism. You thought it was about the proletariat and the bourgeoisie and all that, and it is. But it's so much more. Marx made use of something called the dialectic. It's this idea of doing philosophy, of, of discovering truth. You have a thesis, and then an antithesis, and then a synthesis. Right? That's sort of the way the dialectic works. And that's something we'll spend more time on next week. But he takes this and he uses it as a tool for understanding the world in which he lived, and it shaped the one we live. Now, here's how this goes, Okay. How does Marx, with this philosophy and the use of the dialectic, think about religion? Okay? What was religion to Marx? Well, you have to think about it in terms of how it relates to the two groups of people. Because there's always two groups. Always. There's the oppressors and the oppressed. Always. In Marxism. Always. Always. I keep on getting it. Always. So for the oppressor... You know what religion is? It is a tool to keep the oppressed in oppression. That, that's what it's for. If, if you, the one who has the power, can persuade the one who doesn't have the power that there's some sort of moral um, merit to it, to suffering well or whatever, all you're doing is, is using a philosophy to keep them in chains. So religion is a tool by which the powerful keep the, those that don't have power from getting the power. And if you are in that group, if you are the one that doesn't have the power, then religion for you is just a sign of intellectual weakness. You've been taken in by this tool of the oppressor. So, so what is then his vision for what humans need to do? Well, you need to, you need to think for yourself. You can't be told. What we've just witnessed here with Marxism is the birth of identity politics. We thought that was new. It's not. It's Marxism that anchors identity politics. That we were supposed to be a meritocracy, right? That was, that was the concept of equality in, in the America that I knew, right? But no, identity politics has now been born. Merit doesn't factor in. We just are going to discern who's got the power and who doesn't, and we're just going to transfer it, use the state to forcefully... To, to forcefully do that. Marx's philosophy then gives way to Nietzsche. You've probably heard of this guy. What's he going to add to this? 
The idea that morality is just a means of taste. It's personal taste. Right? That's, what, that's what good and bad is. In fact, it's not good or bad. You wouldn't say that. You wouldn't say, this is good, this is bad. By the way, this is a conversation we have in our family a lot. Right? We try to teach our kids to understand the difference between a fact and an opinion. This food is disgusting. No, you don't like this food, right? That song stinks. No, you just don't like that song. It's funny how it's always a negative that I'm, you know, it's funny how that works. You know, that's an important distinction and we adults need that one too, right? We think if we think it, it must be true. If we feel it, it must be true. But that kind of thinking in, in the Nietzschean philosophy has become, that's what morality is. It's just a preference. It's, it's, you can't say it's bad, it's good. You can only say it's hurtful or affirming. And it's not about what is in reality good or bad. It's in how it makes me feel. You see where we're going. And of course, just like Marx, morality then is just a tool of oppression. Right? He talks about something called slave morality. He actually quotes 2 Corinthians 12, where Paul writes this, God's strength is made perfect in weakness. <clears throat> to him, that's the epitome of evil. That is a tool of the power class, teaching those without the power to see the merit in their suffering and thereby not free themselves from your shackles. A verse that has comforted me so many times over the years. A verse that is meant to show me what God can do in a weak vessel and how glorious a thing that can be. To Nietzsche, that's the epitome of evil. And it's out of Nietzsche where we get the idea of the ubermensch, Superman. You know what the Superman is? It's the Superman is the one who rises to the task of self-creation, basically by doing whatever works for you. Or you do you. And the big effect that this had on society is, is the abolition of what we call the pre-political. Right? Everything's poli political now. That's what this kind of thinking does. <laughs> Sex isn't something you do in your bedroom. It's a political matter now. Religion is not something that you're entitled to. It's not a freedom anymore because it's a political issue. If religion is a tool of oppression, it's a political issue. And the state has an interest in it. So, so that's what Marx and Nietzsche did for us. They abolished the pre-political. Everything is politicized now. Have you wondered why that's the case? There it is. And then one more thinker, everyone's favorite psychoanalyst, Freud. What's he gonna add? Hmm, think it might be the thing in the middle? <laughs> Have something to do with that, right? Here's what Freud's going to do. He's gonna take Rousseau's idea. Rousseau was the guy that said, the, the, the authentic self is the one you find by looking deep within yourself and you need to express that out to the world. Freud adds something to that about human nature. He says that that thing in the deepest part of you is your sexual drive. That's what Freud does. So if you combine Rousseau and Freud, what we now have is a being whose most authentic self is found inward but more specifically to discover the true sexual self on the inside, right? But here's the interesting thing about Freud. He acknowledged that civilization had an interest in having sexual ethics and that was actually a good thing. He recognized that permissive sexual ethics would be bad. So what he was trying to communicate was we're screwed. The deepest, truest, most authentic version of yourself is the sexual desires you have, but in the interest of society, you must suppress them. So you're screwed. You don't get to be the most authentic version of yourself. So now you may you can see why he's always talking. Everything's about sexual frustration for Freud. Everything. So summarizing, well, this I think, that, that sort of thought cloud and the four fingers, the author of the book, um, Strange New World, Carl Truman, he, he says this. I think this summarized the last 10 minutes, I think, really well. The authentic person is the sexual being, the one guided by the inner voice of a sexualized nature. And the role of education is not to repress that for the purpose of personal formation, but to liberate it for the purpose of self-expression. 
So the answer to the question, how did it become normal to accept and refer to a woman trapped in a man's body? Well, that, that's it. Because we have a new con concept of what the self is. It's what's inside that makes me me, and what's inside is my sexual self. And it's my job to discover it and express it, and your job to validate it. That's how we got here. But then the question is, aren't these guys all dead? Can you, can you come up to the modern day? Sure. How did this come to dominate the culture? Well, I've got four ideas of how this happened. Technology. Technology. We've gone from a fixed to a plastic world in, in, in the vision of the author. From a fixed to a plastic world. If I was born in the 1400s, I might know 150 people my whole life. I might travel within 10, 15, 20 miles of my home my whole life. My faith, my religion was decided for me from the day I was born, and I would even present it with another option, more than likely. My spouse may have been decided for me, for me before I was born. Like, everything about my life was fixed back then. That is not true now. Because of technology, you can travel the world. You can expose yourself to an infinite number of ideologies, Religions and philosophies and cultures, cuisines, musics, personal tastes, it, the limits are endless. And we think about the way the internet has accelerated that even more, social media even more. And one of the things that the way social media has accelerated this is it's become, it's allowed a performative culture where social media is the thing by which I perform. That's really what it's become. I'm going to present to the world this curated version of myself. Filtered. I'm not going to tell you the stuff I don't want you to see. All, all that stuff. Right? This is a, the curated version. Technology has made this possible. Right? A second one is, is the collapse, let's be honest, the overturning of traditional external sources of identity. Right? And here's what I mean. Three things specifically. The church. The family. And the state. How did our culture get dominated by those things? Because we've decided those things don't have a say anymore. I'm Dan Hermes, a Christian, son of John and Mary, and I'm an American citizen, right? I didn't decide my citizenship. I didn't decide my name. I didn't decide my, well, a lot of things. They were decided for me. And when I made the decision to follow Jesus, He's making the decisions for me now, right? I say, here you go. Have your way in me. You, you tell me what I'm supposed to be and do. The church, just a tool of oppression. The family, family is not who you're born with. Family is your community. More on that later. And the state, oh man, the state. You know, it's fun. You, th you think about the way our discourse has disintegrated over the last few years. It's like we, we pine for the days when there would be passionate debates by politicians who would talk about policies and the best ideas for how to fix problems. And that really boiled down to how much tax relief should we give people and, and how big a state program should we have. But that's, no, oh, those are the days. Because now, politics is about the narrative. We can't even agree that we're all Americans anymore. Right? That, that's truly the case. We're literally having a fight about our national identity. We have documents which tell us this is who we are, that are 250 years old. That doesn't matter anymore. Be because apparently those documents that say this is who we are, by definition, who we want to be, who we're obligated to be and to conform to, it's called the law, of the land. But now we have this idea of, no, that's not, that's not the true story of when we were found. It's 1619, right? They pick a story, a true story, right? And make it sound like, well, that's the real America. So, so it's a competition for a narrative. And so we can just say, no, I'm not American. That's not my America. That's not my family. That's not my church. Those, those things don't matter. And those, those used to be formational and identity. Not anymore. Two more things. One's called the politics of recognition. Okay, this is where it's not enough for you to say, 
acknowledge that I'm free to make decisions, you must not just tolerate, you must validate, you must recognize and affirm me. I mentioned Glennon Doyle earlier. After she came out, a friend of hers, a former friend from her church, wrote to her lovingly, you know, I, I love you, but I'm not okay with your lifestyle, blah, 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 blah. And Glennon Doyle's response, one of the things she said, she basically said, if, if you don't celebrate with me, you don't love me. One line in particular, if you vote against me, you don't love me. See, you must validate me. You must recognize me. Otherwise, you're just gaslighting me. Right? And then finally, imagined community. Imagined community. This is where, again, this card goes with technology and the breakdown of the family. My family can be whoever I want it to be. Subreddit, Discord, chat rooms, Facebook, whatever you want. I can find an affinity group for anything I want. And if we're talking about sexual topics, I got something that I'm into that is weird. And I Google it, I'll find there's a million people who, who meant the same thing I'm into. Even if it's furries. Yeah. There's lots of them. They have conventions. Right? The impossibility of discovering that you are a furry and there was another furry in the world prevented you from expressing that. Thank God for that mercy. <laughs> That's not the case anymore. You can find people who are like, yeah, me too. So, so, so because we can live in these imagined communities, again, that's one of those things that paves the way for all of that to come over and to dominate our culture. So here's the big objection, though. You hear it everywhere you go. People just want to be happy. People just want to be happy. And it's actually a pretty powerful argument because it's kind of true. And I want to be happy. And I do want you to be happy. Love is love, right? we often hear. And, and they could even say, it's in our documents, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We have a constitutional obligation to ensure this thing. Don't you just want everyone to be happy? It's funny though, how definitions change. What do we mean by life? What do we mean by liberty? What do we mean by happiness? They're all on the table. The words matter. The definitions matter. Let's look at life. We are now living in a world where life and personhood are two different things. Peter Singer, have you ever heard of this guy? He's a crazy ethicist. Basically thinks animals are more precious than embryos. And, and actually acknowledges that fetuses are... That's life. They're human beings, but they're not persons, he says. Right? We call this a fact value split. Okay? So in the realm of facts, that's a life. But in the realm of values, they have not yet attained personhood. Right? The biology deals with the facts, the feelings, and the desires is where values come from. And since that hasn't been integrated, they have life, but not personhood. And what's the highest value? Happiness. So if you have a theory of the self where you have a separation of the body, life, and personhood, and the highest of value is happiness, couldn't we just say, well, that, that life can't possibly be happy. Let's just end it. Whether it's in the womb, just after, or near the end of life, what kind of life is that, we might say? They can't have happiness. What's the point of keeping them alive? Liberty. You know what that used to mean? Well, the same guy that wrote it, I think he'd be a good source to go to. Like he wrote it. What did he think it meant? He sort of had this you do you idea, Thomas Jefferson. He's like, hey man, you do what you want to do. I'm cool with that. But then he said this, as long as it neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. That was his idea of liberty. Do what you want, just don't hurt me. And notice he's focused on, on actual stuff. Picks my pocket, steal my property, or break my leg, harm my body. Right? If you don't do those things, you'll, you'll answer. 
And I'll answer. You know what that means now? What liberty means now? It doesn't mean, you know, uh, that which neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. It now means that which, you know, you do you as long as my feelings are hurt and my identity isn't marginalized. Th that's the new conception of liberty. So if that's life, that's liberty. Good luck. I'll close with this. Carl Truman's summary of all this. He observes, isn't this, maybe you've picked up on this, just ironically intolerant? He puts it this way. Radical individual freedom has led to rather authoritarian forms of social control. From elementary schools that teach gender ideology to Ivy League schools that have abandoned traditional curricula, from workplaces that require sensitivity training on transgender issues to big tech giants boycotting the state because of religious freedom legislation passed by democratically elected assemblies, from local school boards pressing ideological uniformity through the rhetoric of diversity to national governments broadening civil rights legislation to protect chaotic views of gender, right? So radical individual freedom has given form to the authoritarian state. Cognitive dissonance. Well, I told you a little bit about Glenna Doyle. I wanted to wrap up her story. I think it actually seals it well. I told you about her rebellion. I told you her story, a little bit about it. And then, just to be honest, she's, she's a gifted writer. She figured out how to make the oldest lie in the book sound awesome. She doesn't really write in the form of like, you know, a chapter and a thesis and supporting points. She writes these um, more like journal entries. And, and the last one in her book is <coughs> called Human. I'm going to read it to you. In my favorite holy text, there is a poem about a group of people desperate to understand and define God. They ask, what are you? God says, I am. They say, you are what? God says, I am. What are you, Glennon? Are you happy? Are you sad? Are you Christian? Are you a heretic? Are you a believer? Are you a doubter? Are you young? Are you old? Are you good? Are you bad? Are you dark? Are you light? Are you right? Are you wrong? Are you deep? Are you shallow? Are you brave? Are you weak? Are you shattered? Are you whole? Are you wise? Are you foolish? Are you sick? Are you healed? Are you lost? Are you found? Are you gay? Are you straight? Are you crazy? Are you brilliant? Are you caged? Are you wild? Are you human? Are you alive? Are you sure? I am. I am. I am. Hmm. How do we get here? Romans 1. We've exchanged the truth of God for a lie. We've chosen to serve the creation and not the creator. And he's given us over to experience the consequence of our own depravity. I want to end with a little bit of hope. Can we do that? <laughs> the question is this, what are we going to do about it? Right? I told you this a couple of times. The point is not to just get together and go, isn't the world burning? We just let's, you know, and, and to go home depressed. No. I want you actually leaving here with a sense of motivation to do something about it. Because as long as we're here, we've got a mission. Okay? So until he comes, we've got work to do. So I've got six things. I'll do this very briefly, and I'll probably put these in the notes at a later date if you want to look at these again, or I suppose when the video comes out, you can go through it. But I've got six things. Number one, understand our complicity in the cult of happiness. 
understand our complicity in the cult of happiness. The big temptation of tonight is to go all those people. The topics we've discussed tonight, probably we don't think we're talking about us. I promise you we are. Because we have been complicit in the cult of happiness. You know, a few years ago, the big talk in church growth was, was the worship wars because we had this new kind of music. And there were wars in every church and wars were dividing and separating, right? Because the old and the new had different conceptions of what kind of music we should be listening to. It's really sad. Because I absolutely think that we should have substantive dialogue about what's appropriate in, in the use of, of the praise of God. And that should be theological. And, and is it clear? And there are, there's criteria for sure. But you know what? It's not just a matter of preference. And the vast majority of those debates that were destroying many of our churches and dividing many of our churches came down to nothing but personal preference. <laughs> if it's old, it's good. If it's new, it's bad. And I, and, and I learned one thing, and, and I share this with you now, and I, I hope we get that. And I actually had a little experience with this this week. For whatever reason, I pull out my old iTunes. I hadn't opened iTunes in like three years. So I'm clicking through like music I haven't listened to in 10, 15, 20 years. I'm going, oh, I missed this song, right? You know why? Because for me, those were the songs that I was singing when I was running to Jesus. When I was making the decisions for myself, that this isn't just my parents' thing, that I want to serve the Lord with, with all of me, that was the music that was my soundtrack. And it stamped me. And for you, it might have been George Beverly Shea. Right? There, there's something about the music we're listening to when we come to Jesus that makes us think that that's the only good kind of music. When it's just what you were listening to when you met Jesus. And a lot of times it does boil down to personal preference. It's the same thing with preaching. You know, we, we all have our preferences. And you're allowed to have preferences. Right. Our, our, our pastor from years ago, he, he shared this story. He had only been there for a little while. And someone from the congregation came up to him. Pastor, I've got a book I'd like you to read. It's on how to preach. <laughs> you ever remember that story? Yeah. That was wrong. <laughs> that was nothing but personal preference. You don't preach like the person who was here before him. Could you be like him? Okay. You know what I don't do? I don't get in a magazine and say, Jill, could you try looking like this person? You laugh. That's what we're doing. That's how we participate. That's how we're complicit in the cult of happiness. We take our inner desires, our inner feelings, our wants, and we treat them as right and wrong, and we enforce them on people. That's expressive individualism. Don't gaslight me into thinking otherwise. <laughs> Number two, be the best kind of community that we can be, the best kind of community on the planet. Right? That's the way it's supposed to be. There should not be a community like the church. A new command I give you that you love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. The kind of love that we demonstrate to one another should be utterly profound and earth shattering. It shouldn't make sense to an outside world when they watch. We must embrace this kind of community. Open your homes, have people over for dinner, right? Sometimes it's a conversation, show initiative, write a letter, whatever it has to be. We've got to foster this community. We need to be weird with how much we love each other. Number three, worship like we mean it. Your sad face every Sunday morning when you come to church is ruining your child. Show up. And if you don't go here, you got a home church, go there. With joy, if you can. And if not, pray for it. Right? I think one of the best gifts you can give is to worship your Lord in joy. Let them see you 
Let them know that this isn't just a thing that you inherited and you're doing to go through the motions. That you love the Lord Jesus with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. You get up extra early if you have to. You stay up extra late if you have to. You give up. You make the personal sacrifice when it hurts. Worship like you mean it. Number four. Use natural law when we can. Use natural law when we can. What I mean by this is, if you're having a dialogue with someone in the workplace who's not a Christian, I'm not telling you don't quote scripture, go for it. But you would be well suited to learn some of the arguments in books like these. These would be very helpful. They're logical. They're anchored in reality. Reality is pretty palpable. It's pretty compelling. When you can do that. And you may need to be equipped to do that. There are ways of arguing for the interest of the children, for the interest of society, for a reality about human nature that is anchored in, in those kinds of things. And it's helpful to be able to do that when we can. Number five, I got it. This is probably the hardest one for me. Think local, act local. Right? I'm saying this because that's what everyone else says. Everyone who I know and love who who, who talks about these kinds of things, this is what they always come back to. You gotta, you gotta be focused on what's local. And that's hard for me because I, I have a hard time getting interested with local elections and school boards, and even though that's where it's at. It really is. I'm persuaded that this is the way we ought to be. And I'm still getting there though in practice, I admit it. But I do think this is a huge part of the solution. And, the, and as our nation continues to fight, and we see sheriffs and governors and things like that take a stand. You know, we may have some havens of safety, you know. Um, we may have schools, districts, reclaimed. We may have, I mean, that's the kind of thing that we're going to need. We're not going to probably win it at the national level. It's not going to happen. But if we can create communities at the local and state level that enshrine these values in a way that makes sense in time, we get to show the world what works. So think global, but act local. And then here's the last thing. Be neither pessimistic nor optimistic, but full of hope. <laughs> Be neither pessimistic nor optimistic, but full of hope. So pessimism is, psh, we're not going to wake up tomorrow. China, Russia, Biden might fall and hit the nuclear button on accident. You know? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> right. Right. That's pessimism. Right. right? We all sort of have that bent, I think. But we need to guard against that. You know, a few reminders about who's really in charge ought to do as well. About who wins in the end ought to do as well. Those kinds of things we need to remind it of it. But I also don't think we should necessarily be optimistic. I don't think it's very realistic. I don't know of the nation in history that has come back from this. The Romans one reality is, is here. It's not coming. It's here. And there's only one solution, and that's repentance at a national level. And, that, and that's, that's why I'm not really interested in policy these days. All I'm interested in is repentance. You want to know what I think the world needs to do? It's not embrace this policy or this party. It's repent. Because that's what God is here. That's why I'm full of hope, though. It's because... My hope is not anchored to my country. I would like to see it survive. I'd like to see repentance. I'd like to see it. I'd like to see revival. I pray for revival. Real revival. Right. I'm full of hope, though, because God has been faithful to the church. God has been faithful to the church. He's the one that builds it. And against it, the gates of hell shall not prevail. Whatever happens to America... The church isn't going away. And I believe that with every fiber in my being. So as long as we have breath, we need to be a people who gladly show that joy. The joy of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And to negotiate these kinds of things with, with peace. Like, I know, you know, you take my life. Go for it. Send me to heaven early. Thank you. When's the last time you thought that way? We should. If you die, I'll miss you, but I'll be happy for you. 
And then they're pessimistic, nor are they optimistic, but full of hope. Well, we've gone, sorry, <laughs> a lot longer than I thought. I'm going to work really hard on getting these shorter. I'm going to pray, and um, we'll, take a, we'll take a break. Father, if I've rambled on too much, forgive me. The point is not uh, for me to talk. It's for us to have a better understanding of, of how we got here. I hope that we've been encouraged on some level to, to grow closer to you and to each other. And Lord, I ask that even, even just the fact of what we're doing tonight, coming together to say, here it is. This is reality. Well, we've come together tonight. Thank you for the freedom to do that. But we're a community. We want to be known by you more than we want to be loved by the world. We want to walk with you more than we want to have all the wealth and the trappings of, that the world has to offer. And Lord, I, so I just ask that you would help us to think clearly, to feel correctly, that we would be submitted to you in our hearts and our minds, that we would be available for the remolding, and that those parts in us that are still in rebellion to you, that you would take a hold of them, that you'd mold us, and that you'd bring us back. And Father, I, I think maybe I shouldn't end tonight without, without one more request. If you would be so merciful, God save us. Would you pour out your mercy on our nation. I call it mercy because I know we don't deserve it. I don't understand, to be honest with you, why you haven't removed us from the face of the earth already. We've been running away from you for a long time. Father, I ask that you would find in this church and in others who follow you all over the country and in the world, a remnant of people that you can use to glorify your name, to spread the gospel out all over the earth, to bring the lost into your kingdom. And may we leave here energized for that mission, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.